Hey, we've got a problem here. What did you do? Nothing. I stirred the tanks. Whoa. Hey. Uh, this is Houston. Uh, say again, please. Houston, we have a problem. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and I don't know, when I woke up today, I, I heard rumors of a bloodbath at D.C. Some of the, um, the details kind of started trickling in. It sounds like a lot of people were laid off, although I guess, you know, in some ways this could have been expected. Hirsch and myself have been talking about how D.C. have been evolving the, the future of the company as far as comic books, moving kind of more focused towards digital, certainly more focused towards graphic novels aimed at new demographics that are expanding within the market. We certainly saw that with uh, the record number of, of comic sales in 2019. You know, we saw that was uh, largely due to new markets as far as graphic novels for kids, you know, teenagers, stuff like that. So with me here to talk about all this stuff is my my friend, the Poobah of Comics. Perch, how you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. And feels like we've been covering DC and there are various trials forever. It certainly does. I do want to say this. If you're visiting for the first time or you've been coming around and you want all the latest, greatest comic book news or information regarding all the news that's out there, there's a lot of hot takes. But you come here to Thinking Critical. You come to Comics by Perch for, for honest takes. You know, we'll, we'll take out the kind of emotion and just kind of give you the straight 411. And certainly subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up. You know, if you enjoy the video, give us a thumbs down if you think we got this take, take wrong. In the video description, there will be a link to Purchase Channel. He's producing two to three videos a day just about the comic book industry. Lots of news, lots of takes. And obviously, at the end of the video, there will be an opportunity to subscribe then as well. All right, now, Perch, we, we started um, getting a lot of misinformation with half-truths on this. Obviously, we, it kind of came out of bleeding cool first. But now that we're getting a better picture, there are a lot of layoffs from DC Comics and also with DC Universe. We could have all seen all this coming. Obviously, DC no longer is just DC Comics. It's part of a larger corporate structure. There was just an enormous change at Warner Media, where they, they basically changed out all the leadership. A lot of the executives were removed. I think there's been 800 layoffs throughout Warner Media. Obviously, it was going to affect DC Comics, but it's still sad. It is. I mean, you know, I think it's it's not fun for people to lose their jobs. Um, it's it's uh, it's upsetting. It's scary, both for the people laid off, the people laid, left behind. I mean, a lot of these people were friends, and I, I would urge people because I'm seeing a lot of there's a, like you said, so many hot takes, and some of those are you know I'm not sorry that those people lost their job. They they brought in this agenda into DC Comics. I get it um, that you're upset about what's happening in the comics, but people losing their jobs, no matter who you are, it's it's not fun. It's it's a gonna be a tough time for them, their families, whoever else it happens to be. So you know, your you, your heart goes out to those people if they land on their feet. In many cases, whether you like the work or not, you know, I, you, you, empathy is still a valuable thing. So for all the people across Time Warner, uh, Warner Media, and, and everything that was going on here, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a sad day. Absolutely, is a sad day. I don't I don't want to see anybody lose their job, but there were some high interest, high vis people. Let's talk about the one thing that was definitely misinformation. When I read the, the opening article, it, it basically stated that Jim Lee is no longer the publisher, but yeah. remains with the company, which was a gross mischaracterization would have happened. Jim Lee was promoted. Yes. Yeah, Jim Lee was absolutely promoted. And and this is where, you know, long memories is helpful. So when Dan Didio exited the company, Jim Lee had that job. There's tons of articles. There's tons of, of reports, not from you know commentators, but from you know the company itself or places like Variety, Hollywood Reporter. We knew Jim Lee was didn't love that role, and and we know this just studying Jim Lee's history for you know decades. He's never loved this role, and he he had bigger ambitions. I think the removal of Didio kind of locked him into a role for a few months, as it turned out, longer than than they were intending. But this is always a trajectory and the plan. So Jim Lee, as part of this entire story, is is really it's not a factor. He, he, there was no he was not impacted by the layoffs. Like you said, it, it, he he his position is stronger today than it was yesterday. It's interesting. He was almost like he uh, you know he he got elevated and locked into the position, which was probably going to be temporary. And then all of a sudden, the pandemic happened, and he basically became like the crisis manager. And kind of guided DC through comics through some a very difficult time, brought on competition for Diamond Comics distributors, and also started this enormous focus towards digital comics with all these DC digital firsts, a lot of different initiatives. 
certainly showed a new vision for DC Comics. It appears to be in line with what Warner Media and their new overlords at AT&T have in mind. And now he's like in charge of, it sounds like, corporate synergy for DC characters in development. Yeah, and, and as we've been talking about, I remember on your channel months and months ago, I, I can't remember the first time we said this, but when all the rumors started that AT&T would sell off DC, which is kind of the, the panicky fire rumors, like a year ago, people were saying this. And as you and I made the point, I mean, DC, AT&T deliberately kept DC in the acquisition. They did not have to. They wanted DC as a property. They had clearly big plans for DC and, and in terms of both an IP house and for all the entertainment properties it brought. And their vision has, has clearly been to elevate DC as a brand and utilize it more across the AT&T networks, across Warner Media. That's, that's what they wanted to do. And that's in many cases what we're seeing today. Today, DC as a brand is, is being pushed into other businesses. There's, there's parts of DC that are going to fill the void that other people laid off in other divisions now will leave. And Jim Lee finds himself in a really nice position where he's managing a portfolio of characters and IP at a much bigger scale. I mean, it's not quite at this level, but Jim Lee finds himself somewhat equivalent to Kevin Feige in, in many respects for AT&T. That's, that's not a bad place to be. Yeah, he's not going to be producing movies, but he is going to be responsible the way the characters are handled across the different platforms and mediums. Yes, the showrunner. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to give the impression. I don't see anything on the books that he's going to be a producer. So maybe that analogy with Feige is not perfect, but it, it is that it's part of the portfolio. That, that's mm -hmm. what we So it was very interesting. Like I said, that was such a mischaracterization about what happened in Jim Lee. He's been promoted. Now, there were a couple of people that, that were let go that I found a bit surprising, the first being the editor-in-chief, Bob Harris. Obviously, with, with Jim Lee no longer the publisher, Bob Harris is no longer the EIC. Dan Didio recently was fired, who was the co-publisher. That is an enormous amount of change as far as the leadership at DC Comics. I believe some people have been elevated, but it has not been confirmed who the new publisher and EIC are. But Bob Harris has been with DC Comics for a very long time. I was a bit surprised to see he was gone, but obviously he could be considered kind of, you know, the old guard and maybe had uh, visions about what the comic book industry were that weren't in line with, with, with uh, AT&T and Time Warner moving forward. Yeah, and that's that's the speculation. I, I've, I've talked to a few people involved, not not Bob Harris, but a few of the other people who, who did lose their jobs. And I think that there's a belief, at least, that... Uh, you know, it, it was part of, like you said, it was the old guard. It was maybe a group of executives who were not going to make the transition as easily into what they want uh, with synergy across different business units. And I think there's also a, a belief that some of these people might have been, I don't know, for lack of a better word, Didio loyalist people who kind of were really trapped in that old mentality who were just not going to come along. Um, I, I think that there's a couple of people within DC that, that are probably happy with some of the changes that have been made, people who are not necessarily part of that group. And uh, I think that when Didio left, a few people, Bob Harris, probably Brian Cunningham, um, certainly uh, Mark Doyle, I think all probably felt like their time was limited uh, after Didio was removed. And, and I think I would speculate that this pandemic slowed some of this stuff down, that we probably would have seen some of these moves, you know, at least two months ago in the summer. I think that that uh, I think that some of this was was planned and it drug out a bit. Another bit uh, surprising person that was let go, and this is for a different reason, is Vice President of Global Publishing and Initiatives and Digital Strategies, Bobby Chase, held in high regard within the company, certainly well-liked throughout the industry, and has a great reputation as someone with a vision for comics moving forward. Surprised that that, that, that Bobby Chase was let go. Yeah, I, I was too. I think Bobby Chase is, um, I, I mean, I, I've known Bobby Chase for, for a long time. You're absolutely right. I think uh, there are very, very few people have a negative word to say about her. Very smart, um, capable of running a line, and I think uh, is, is definitely an asset to a company. Um, I, I think, you know, there's some speculation kind of around maybe some belief at the higher levels that, that job was redundant with other departments that they were merging in. And so that's that's kind of a sad thing that has happened there with uh, with Bobby. But um, I, I I'm of all the people, I'm, I'm hoping that she lands on her feet. I feel very fond of her uh, as a, both an individual and contributor to comics. So uh, I, I was joking with you earlier. I think if uh, if I could like wave a magic wand and install her as the uh, editor in chief over at Marvel, I would do that in a heartbeat. I mean, she she made uh, her 
you know, a bit of a legacy over at Marvel. I think she was the first uh, female editor in chief at that company and um, just just a, a brilliant talent. So that that one that one hurts. Absolutely. But apparently, uh, hopefully she'll there'll be greener pastures ahead and, and she'll get an opportunity with another company, maybe even in a higher uh, portfolio and, and um, you know, job title and, and be able to affect change in an even better manner moving forward. Now, mm -hmm. there is uh, obviously a lot of the editorial staff is having a lot of these shakeups. Uh, the three big editors that names that are out there, Brian Cunningham, Mark Doyle and Andy Corey. Obviously, Mark Doyle and Andy Corey are essentially the guys running the Vertigo 20 fifth or 20th anniversary relaunch that absolutely failed. They were moved over to DC Black Label, which has been considered kind of a success for DC Comics. But thinking about it, when DC Black Label launched, what's the first thing that happened? Batwang. That also coincided essentially with the acquisition of uh, Time Warner, Warner Media by AT&T. It certainly left the new corporate overlords, left a bad taste in their mouth. And uh, so I, I don't know that Mark Doyle was probably held in high regard after causing that controversy, or maybe perceived to have caused that controversy. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think that left a, a you know a stain a bit on his career, and I think that combined with other things. I, I mean, it's hard to say whether that was on people's minds when this all rolled down, but it certainly didn't help him. And I think it it what's going to be very important, and you you see it in these stories and kind of the moves they make and the restructuring that they've done, is that it, it's going to be very important to have a really good cooperation, very good uh, operations within the company, these different business units functioning really, you know, seamlessly together, not causing hiccups, not rocking the boat, none of those. No, that's that's what's going to be important at AT&T right now. And so, you know, Doyle, for good or for bad or for fair or not fair, um, he's got the, uh, the 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 batwang, that uh, controversy <laughs> that's, that's stuck to him. And, uh, and that's going to hurt. And then Andy Curry, I think, as, as well, made a bunch of very controversial decisions, uh, certainly with Vertigo and kind of the talent that was brought in and curated. And then he also, uh, more than probably any of the others, has a social media presence that is, uh, you know, to a corporation, just toxic. I mean, whether you agree with him or disagree with him, that kind of stuff is just does not play at a corporation. And I think that's that's certainly um, a factor. Uh, and, and I think as, as you will see AT&T try and rein in social media policies and other things, as they kind of get everything into gear, um, having somebody at a senior level, especially as somebody like an editor, they need people who are going to toe the line and, and be, you know, uh, me more balanced. Um, you know, everybody's allowed to kind of speak their minds and go off script from time to time, but not not at the almost daily level he was. So moving <laughs> on, <clears throat> I mentioned on the channel, I don't know, think I talked with you about this, but we were kind of talking about HBO Max coming online, DC Universe being redundant. Not surprising that they felt a lot of these layoffs, the kind of DC Universe feels like it should even be there. All that stuff should just go into HBO Max. Hopefully the subscription service with the comic book access will be moved over there, although I, I, I somewhat doubt it, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. that kind of stuff was, was uh, the writing was on the wall once the HBO Max kind of became the priority. And a lot of all these changes at Warner Media are with HBO Max in mind because the, the rollout was an absolute dud. I believe they only have like 4 million people that have signed up. The price tag is really high. I think at $15 for a, a month for a subscription. I think there's another 30 million customers that should be able to roll over because of like HBO Now and HBO Go. Yep. But they don't even use the service. So it has been a massive flop. And this, a lot of this change has to do with this, but also has to do with the pandemic. And that's why we're getting this massive restructure and all these layoffs over at Warner Media. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and and this was we knew this was coming. Uh, this restructuring when the acquisition took place, they they talked about you know in in nicest ways corporate synergy and and all those things, but that's code at many times for for layoffs or redundancies. You have jobs that overlap. Redundancies was talked about a lot. Yep, and, and so this is that action taking place. The one thing I'd, I'd urge your viewers to do because there's there's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of hot takes, uh, like you said. And uh, people are lumping in DC and DC Universe together as, as one thing. DC, all things considered, now granted, it doesn't, I'm not making light of, of the layoffs that they had, they didn't have that deep of cuts. DC Universe had very deep cuts, but those are two separate things. So as you see a lot of articles that are trying to make it out like uh, DC was just cut to the bone and this was the, the worst thing that's ever happened uh, in the history of DC, uh, keep in mind they're they're grouping two things that are not the same thing, and it's again not to make light of of the the people who lost their jobs today, but it's it's uh, 
it's being exaggerated to a place that's not healthy. And I think if you are are listening to this and watching this and thinking, you know, tomorrow DC will stop publishing comics, uh, I've seen people in the industry, artists and writers, saying things like they don't even have enough people to produce comics right now. They can't they can't even get comics out the door with the amount of people that have been let go. Um, that is that is not the case. They can still absolutely print comics, um, and it is uh, you know just you got to keep it in perspective. Talking about DC Comics, kind of specifically about their production, it does sound like they're going to be streamlining the line, much like what Marvel is doing. They're taking a bit of a different approach. They're putting a focus on YA graphic novels. They're putting an enormous focus on their digital efforts, but they're also putting another focus on these self-contained universes, the White Knight universe, your DC un deceased universe, Injustice, you know, kind of, kind of little pockets of universes within DC Comics that don't necessarily all have to kind of communicate with each other. So we're going to get a streamlined, like main continuity DC universe, and we're going to get little pockets around it and probably cut a lot of the fat. You're probably not going to be see, be seeing uh, RGYN and Genlock and all that crap that, that wasn't selling or any of the, um, the Brian Michael Bendis imprint stuff that he was doing. Yeah. I mean, Right now, what DC needs to do is capitalize on the media efforts they're making, getting some movies out, getting some shows out. They want to have comics that are going to be recognizable. They want to have uh, graphic novels that are going to push into digital and distribution and 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 kind of the booksellers. Um, you know, from what we've said from the very beginning, DC Comics, just the comics division, is still tiny compared to everything else. But the part that is valuable to them, the IP that is created there and the, the connections and the way to test stories before they go to market, um, that's still very valuable, but that means that they're not going to be messing around with a bunch of very experimental, weird kind of line growing titles. They're not an indie comic company. They are a, you know, a corporate comic company and that, that IP means farm. they're an IP farm and, and that's good and bad. I mean, for people who want classic Superman tales, classic Batman tales, I think what you're getting with Joker war, that kind of stuff, I think you're going to keep getting that and you're probably going to get more of that if you really loved, um, I mean, you know, goddess mode and some of those titles, you're not going to find them at DC that, that they're going to be somewhere else. So I, I think that's, that's what you're looking at. Um, and in, in many cases, the kind of experimental, uh, very, like, like I was a fan of Vertigo back in the day, a long time ago with, uh, with shade, the changing man and doom patrol and some of those books. Um, it's unlikely we're going to get stuff like that in the near future. It's just, it's, it's not likely. So, you know, there's goods and bads here, but I think there, you we're looking at a very corporate comic company for ever. All right. So this does create some opportunities and you and I are going to talk about that tomorrow on the channel at the same time this video came, comes out. So if you're enjoying this conversation, you're going to want to come back for this because this isn't all glass, glass half empty. There's a glass half full perspective that you and I are going to talk about tomorrow about what this could mean as far as opportunities for the comic book industry. Now, yep. there's one last thing I do want to talk about. It's August 22nd. It's DC Fandom, which DC yep. Comics, obviously, we're going to be a large part of. DC Universe would have played a, a role in it as well. Obviously, it includes movies and streaming and everything. You know, do, do they blow up Fandom and not do it now? Or do you think they this was purposely done to lead into that where they could kind of talk about the new direction of DC, you know, properties moving forward? Yeah, I absolutely think it was time so they could be able to reset the, the stage at, at fandom. I mean, it was interesting watching people um, comment and tweet saying, wow, this is the worst decision ever. Why would you do this right before their convention? Well, again, look at the ads to the fandom and look at the names they were promoting and some of the things on this giant trailer. Um, it's not like they were going through the deep cuts of DC editorial on that list. They were putting kind of front and center their entertainment properties, a lot of their their partners and how they were re reacting with, with DC. I mean, this is going to be a chance, I think, for them to reset the clock a bit on what DC is. They're going to be able to take the stage and announce how all these entertainment properties are going to work together inside the Warner Media umbrella. Uh, I, I think the timing of this was completely in alignment with what they want to do with that show. And I mean, it's for the people saying, oh, why would you like, why would you fire Andy Curry right before you know, this, this big event, it's like, uh, he was a non-factor in that big event. I, I mean, that, not mean to be harsh about it, but he, he was not going to be a, a, a big presence there in any respect. So this is going to be all about how they're going to announce their digital initiatives, how they're working with other companies, how they're tying in all their media, uh, you know, ventures that they're all bought into. And, and it's, you know, whether it's good or not is a different story, but I think it's definitely all timed. In my military days, 
we, we would talk about, you know, uh, bad news doesn't get better with, with age and also never put off for tomorrow what you can take care of today. Obviously, this needed to be taken care of. I think it times up perfectly with fandom where you can kind of talk about the new direction and, and the new exciting things that you can have. It'll just be like a Band-Aid was pulled off. There's some outrage, and now there's going to be new things to talk about. And obviously, uh, I don't know. Do you think they 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 dropped the, the frumpy Wonder Woman cover just to, you know, to take <laughs> some of the heat off? No, I, I mean, that's an interesting theory, but no, I think I, 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 I mean, that's all about rooster teeth and which is, you know, conceivably, we don't know the numbers, but that there's, there's a possibility of rooster teeth is making more money than the DC publishing division was in a weird, weird world. Um, I, I, pro, I, who knows? Uh, maybe, maybe not. That may be a crazy statement on my part, but it's, it's, I think so. I, we'll see. I, I it's, it's, they're, they're merchandising and other stuff they do. I, I don't know. It's it's nuts. Well, DC's merchandising efforts are like no. Sorry, I mean just the publishing, not the merchandising. <laughs> DC merchandising outdoes the DC publishing by several miles. Does I mean, does the outdoes the entire comic book industry? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm being a bit tongue in cheek here, but I mean I, I think that that's that's where these connections are are made, and um, it's uh, yeah. I mean it's it's interesting. I I think. Um, uh, what's what's also funny about these takes is people are like man people are going to go to this fandom and they're going to be outraged and they're going to tip things over it's like what are you talking about it's an online event sure. DC completely controls the stage and who's talking and the chats you think yeah do you think somebody's going to be able to interrupt the stream and get on and, and complain about the firings and then that's going to happen like <laughs> this is like people may complain on twitter but i i don't think at&t or or warner media cares very much about that at this point Definitely interesting days going ahead. It sounds like Marvel and DC are essentially going through their own versions of kind of the same thing where they're, they're looking at the market, they're seeing the way it's evolved, and they're both reacting. Obviously, they're, they're doing something similarly, but they're definitely going in their own unique directions. It's going to be very uh, interesting to keep an eye on. Like I said, come back here for all the latest and greatest. We'll probably be talking about this in the days ahead when more information is fleshed out about this. Obviously, we'll be covering Marvel because they should have something similar to this uh, you know, within the next few months. And like I said, if you're interested in the comic book industry and comic book news, just subscribe right here to Thinking Critical YouTube, but also go over and subscribe to, to Comics by Perch. Two to three videos a day about news, the industry, lots of, of great information over there. And you should see an, an icon on the, on the uh, channel right now where you can just click it and go subscribe. Well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I, I, I always like talking to you and it's, it's interesting times. So <laughs> thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. We're going to talk about this glass half full idea yes. that I have. We're going to do it.